Well, grace and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Savior Jesus Christ. We have a special set of readings today that have really helped us hear God and God's call for us as a people, God's desire for us, uh, for the purpose and the work of our lives, and God's promise for us to be with us. And that life isn't at an end or necessarily um, at a bad place, that we are just at a point where God is continuing to do what God wants to do and invites us to be a part of that. And though there may be other distractions around us, we are called as God's people to participate in the gift of being the church. And God calls us to be this church in times of joyfulness, but also in times of need. And if ever, I think, for us, we're experiencing times of need. And so we hear each Sunday as we gather in a new way what God is calling us to do. And what does this mean for us in our lives? So I pray as we dwell on God's word together today, uh, you may hear God speak to you in some special nudge for you. I recently watched a, a YouTube video for Richard uh, Rohr. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan priest um, out of New Mexico, I believe is where he's from. He was also noted by PBS as one of the um, top or the leading spiritual leaders in the world on, on how we're giving us understanding about God. Um, and anyway, in this, he was speaking at, a, at an Episcopal church in Pasadena uh, several years ago, and he, talk, he started off his talk by just saying, basically, let me share with you some verses from John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, the third chapter, God says, or this says, For God did not send his own Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And then he says, let's look at John chapter 5, 17, where it says this, My Father goes on working, and so do I. And then he lifts up the third passage that's from John 14, 26. And it says, the Holy Spirit will teach you everything and remind you of everything. So God is in the world that my father goes on working and so do I. And that the Holy Spirit teaches us everything and reminds us of everything. And we remember that last one in John's gospel, the 14th chapter, it starts out by saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. It's about trusting God. And his point, I think, when he was talking to these folks was, we have a very active God. We have a God who's involved with God's creation and a God who loves it dearly. And, and sometimes, he said, the Father and the Holy Spirit are kind of left out of the situation. And his words are, we often overplay the Jesus card. And we stop realizing that Jesus is part of the Trinity that not only created the world, but is at work in it today still. Um, and so that God is very active and God is involved. And that there is a paradigm shift for us as people who think like people living in the world and people who have faith that believe that God is active in this world that we live in. Um, and he talks about it's hard for us to make change or these paradigm shifts. And that's a scientific term, he says, that equals uh, in the religious realm is a major conversion. It's hard for us to have a conversion when we feel like we're already converted. It's hard for us to feel the nudge of the spirit when it moves us away from our comfort. And right now we're feeling a little uncomfortable, but we are trusting the spirit. So he goes on to say that this person that he knows, Ken Wilbur, he says, on a good day, a healthy person uh, is at most willing to call into question about 5% of how they already think. Um, and he talks about, he's just saying how we get stuck into our way of thinking. Most days, the ego, he says, is so entrenched, um, all it gets in is what you already are thinking because you're right and you don't need to have somebody else tell you what to do. And so his point was this, that we need contemplation, that God gave us the seventh day, the Sabbath, for a reason, that people just don't grow because they're so addicted to their own way of thinking. And he talks about that this universal way that we have about focusing on what we're doing um, and on our way of thinking is that we can become addicted to that. We can become addicted to our work and a different, addicted to our thoughts and our lifestyle. And he goes on to say, without the practice of contemplation or these spiritual disciplines, 
we have a hard time of loosening our grip. We have a hard time of saying, you know, God, maybe you are right. Maybe I need to stop these things. I did do a Google search and it said the top things that are hard to say are, I love you, and also I'm sorry, and also you were right. So we have these passages today, and dwelling in the Word, um, you know, what do we think about this today? where we read this portion of scripture given for us today, and then we ask questions about it, and then we say, what is God trying to say to us today? Well, today we hear from Paul, um, Paul who in a sense was dwelling in the world in his own way. He was dwelling in the living word, Jesus Christ at the time, and he heard again in his own words. We heard this when he said, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, a tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, I'm a Pharisee. As to zeal, I'm a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, I'm blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I've come to regard as loss because of Christ. And more than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And he goes on to say, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. This one thing I do, forgetting all what lies behind and straining for what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ. This is the definition of us as the church. Forgetting what lies behind us and focusing on what God is calling us to do today, which will lead us into the future. And so do you hear how he dwells in God's work in the world? He lets go of his own ego. You know, he's got this resume of things that he's all about, but he opens up to God and he feels a new nudge forward. And it's a goal of being a part of this heavenly call of Jesus Christ, of being this new thing that God is doing. And this is the same as for you and me in our baptismal call. In our baptism, we hear and we believe that God's work of doing a new thing in us is happening that God makes us new. God gives us this heavenly claim on us, giving us a new name, calling us now to shine and to share the light of Christ who tells us to live by compassion, by love, having compassion for all people. And so those uh, Richard Bohr comments uh, on our trying to get beyond ourselves to listen to God, I guess they kind of jumped out at me and made me think about this passage today. You know, he said, God, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Jesus says, my father goes on working and so do I. And then in John's gospel, we hear the Holy Spirit will teach you everything and remind you of everything. And so are we listening? And so we have this gospel lesson today, the parable of the vineyard. And Jesus has basically given us an example of what happens when we don't allow God to enter in, when we stay focused on ourselves and greed and envy and eventually death and murder versus life takes place. Now in the story, the owner of the vineyard is expecting work, right? And productivity and the workers, well, they expect, they expect to get something out of it. And actually they begin to grow in that expectation. They expect eventually to get the vineyard, to take what they feel can be there somehow. You know, among the most powerful forces that we experience in life are expectations. People expect certain things regarding our speech, maybe, or our behavior, or our character. They, we like to say, expect this of me, and we feel compelled sometimes to live up to that, and it can be hard and stressful. But other expectations come more clearly from within us, and we accept certain norms, and we expect ourselves to toe a line a certain way. And there's some expectations that are out there that are unjust. They demand that we do what we can't or we shouldn't do. And there are also some expectations that are just out there. They call on us to do what we can do and maybe even what we need to do in a moment of need. And then there's this. What are God's expectations of us? That's one of the questions I had as I dwelt in today's readings for this Sunday. What are God's expectations of us? What does the one who made us look for from us? And today's reading points to such a way. God expects from us a harvest, a good and a bountiful harvest. But he doesn't leave us by ourselves. He gives us all we need. In the reading from Isaiah, it indicated this, that described the vineyard's owner displeasure with grapes that were sour after they were produced. 
And our reading from Matthew takes on a dis- different perspective. There, the tenant farmers refuse to pay the owner his just share. And in each of these, you know, the owner of the vineyard has invested great labor and time and energy and money. And he's provided it with everything necessary for a fruitful harvest, but he ends up empty-handed. His expectations are disappointed. So what does God expect from us in the harvest? God doesn't expect for us to earn our salvation in it. I mean, to close that gap between us and God that only Jesus could do by dying on a, a cross. Because that's what Jesus did, and that's already happened. We have been saved. Christ has done that work for us on the cross. And so now what God expects from us is that as God now lives in our hearts and is a part of our lives, um, that that Christ's death and resurrection will become now fruitful in our lives. That God doesn't want the tremendous seed of faith that's been planted in us to fail, but he wants it to bear fruit. And God looks for the harvest, both in our hidden depths and also in the world around us. God wants that seed of faith in us to grow in such a way that the spirit fruits become abundant through us and in us. See, God cares deeply for his vineyard. And it's on this basis that he looks for the harvest that God doesn't simply demand fruitfulness from us, but God provides all all the conditions that this can happen And God wishes that we would have this abundant life. And so there are a couple of things that we think about with these conditions God has given to us. What has God given to us that we would be productive? Well, first, we've been given his son, Jesus Christ. Without Christ, there's no harvest that is even possible. Without Christ, only our yield is going to be like the Old Testament, sour grapes. But with Christ, whatever harvest God wants from us is possible. You know, even the impossible can be possible. With Jesus, this harvest will and can be abundant. Christ has been given to us. Second thing is that we've been given to each other. You know, we're this diverse gathering of people, and the only one who can unite us is Christ. Christ is the head, and we are just the body, the members, but we are united by this Christ. And if Christ unites us, then not even death can destroy this union that has been made. You know, we are are people, just like members of the body, we are people with widely differing differences and abilities and insights, but all are necessary for completeness and wholeness, and all are important. And we've been given one another. That's the second thing. A third thing is that we've been given certain earthly situational goods. You know, we've been given some money, some land, some building, and some possessions maybe. And by one set of standards, we're pretty rich. When I was in Tanzania, I was told that the people there earn about a dollar a day or live on about a dollar a day. Compared to there, they look at us and say, wow, you guys have it all. But by another set of standards, we're not rich. And these standards probably can confuse us. You know, what matters is that we have what we need to do and what God calls us to do. And we've been given certain goods to use. And I think the last thing is that we've been given this setting this place, this people, this church that we are here. Um, You know, we're living here in Chapin, South Carolina, and our roots are to run deep into the soil here, to the community here, and all who live within a few miles of this place belong to this context that we are a part of. And this community we live in actually hungers for fruitfulness. And we've been put here in this place to witness to God's goodness in our words, but also in our deeds. So we've been given Christ and one another, we've been given earthly goods, and we've been given this specific setting. And these are the conditions for fruitfulness. And God has provided them so that we may produce a harvest. God gives us these conditions for fruitfulness, and as we follow the Spirit and God working in the world, The promise is that though we might not know what's going to be accomplished, we don't know exactly what God might be doing with the work God's doing with us. We do know this, that God promises to be productive through our faithful efforts, that we don't effort in vain. And God may be the one that knows the bigger picture. We're just called to be faithful. And when that happens, we begin to experience goodness ourselves and abundant life, Jesus calls it.
And this means that our fruitfulness might take the form of a very different form from what we expect. And the harvest might even surprise us sometimes because it wasn't what we expected. But it's going to be just as good, if not better. You know, there's a part of the gospel this week that, um, that jumped out at me as I was dwelling in it. And this was the part, it says this, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. And they wanted to arrest him, but they feared that the crowds of the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from people if they don't live into it the way God calls them to. And so a question for me, and maybe for all of us, is am I a part of God's promise productiveness? You know, is my life, are my efforts producing fruits of the Spirit? And when we go to Galatians chapter 5, we read that the fruits of the Spirit are love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control are those the things that I'm a part of when I do my words, when I do my actions, when I live my life? Or do I contribute to the opposite of those things? Anger, malice, factionalism, and disunity, and whatever else is out there that's breaking away the peace that God came to give. You know what? There might be much that we don't know. And yes, life can be as difficult as farming with these elements that we have. And it can be just as hard as farming. But this we do know, that God is at work. That Jesus comes to open our eyes and our minds to God's kingdom, which is now at hand. And that we are claimed and we're called to let go of our selfish ego and our selfish ways to experience this embrace of God that allows us to let go of the world and be transformed in our living to produce the fruits of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen.